For a number of days, residents of the eighth floor of a residential building in the Guangdong city of Zhongshan had complained about an odor permeating the corridors. They got in touch with the building manager Mr. Zhuang, asking him to investigate, as now the stench could be smelt inside the residents' apartments. On reaching the eighth floor it was immediately apparent to Mr. Zhuang, why the tenants' complaints had become increasingly frequent over the past three days. The hideous smell was overpowering, and seemed to cover every inch of the hallway. The building manager found that it seemed to be strongest near room 803, which was being rented by a married couple and their teenage daughter. Mr. Zhuang knocked on the door several times but got no response. The longer he stood outside knocking, the worse the smell got. He used a stool to look through the room's bathroom window. The smell already had him concerned that something happened to the tenants, and what he saw through the window heightened that. There were stains on the bathroom floor that looked like blood. He tried knocking again, but received no answer. Mr. Zhuang forced his way into the room and immediately began looking for the tenants. On entering the room, he had to fight back the urge to throw up his breakfast, so rancid was the air in the apartment. He soon found the teen daughter of the couple that were renting the room. She sat in her bed, half naked from the waist up, staring vacantly at her computer. It seemed like she didn't know Mr. Zhuang was in the room with her. Getting over his shock at the young girl's appearance, he asked why she didn't answer the door. She didn't respond or acknowledge that she heard him speak. It was then when Mr. Zhuang noticed bloodstains on the quilt in bed. He left the girl to look for the other tenants. Instead, he found a number of plastic bags leaking dark colored, false smelling liquid. The police were called, and quickly arrived. On entering the room, the smell informed them they had entered a serious crime scene. The teen girl remained completely unmoved by their arrival. She was emotionless, again not showing any signs that she was no longer alone. Investigators looked through the 42 plastic bags, dotted around the apartment. Each contained some kind of rotting meat, the origin of which the police were confident about. While the police were looking through the bags, the young girl had fallen asleep. Waking her, they began asking the 18-year-old where her parents were. The girl finally spoke, and casually told police she ended her parents' lives, and dismembered their bodies. The girl was arrested and taken away to be questioned, while police started combing the crime scene for evidence. 18-year-old Qi Pingping remained coldly detached as she gave her confession. She told the officers interviewing her that, just four days earlier she had been at home with her father, who was suffering a number of serious health issues. Her mother came home late in the evening, having been out square dancing with friends. Her mother and father then got into an argument, which the young girl attempted to stop. Her mother turned her anger to Qi Pingping, berating her daughter for staying at home online, instead of going out to work and earn some money for the family. Her mother then started talking about how things would be better if they all just died. Words the young Qi Pingping had become accustomed to hearing from the mouth of her mother when she was in a bad mood. This time, however, hearing the words caused Qi Pingping to snap, and she attacked her mother. She managed to place a plastic bag over her head, slowly suffocating her. The father of Qi Pingping was bedridden due to his health issues and was unable to get off the bed to help his wife. He could only watch on helplessly as his daughter took her mother's life. Once her mother had stopped breathing, Qi Pingping turned to her father. She placed the same plastic bag over his head, pulling the handles tight around his neck. In his weakened state of health he was unable to fight her off, and his life was slowly ended. With both her parents lying dead, she went to her computer, and started searching for methods of body disposal. She decided the most effective way would be dismemberment. She dragged her mother and father into the bathroom, and began the gruesome task. However, the knives in the kitchen were somewhat blunted, making it a long drawn out process. In a hot and humid Guangdong September, the body parts quickly started to smell. To counteract this, the teenager made the disturbing decision to boil as much of her parents' flesh as she could. She then packed the remains into 42 plastic bags, living with the rotting flesh until Mr. Zhuang entered the room days later. What investigators discovered in the apartment seemed to support her confession. They found several knives left in the kitchen sink with blood and human tissue still on the blades, as Qi Pingping had made no attempt to clean them. There was also evidence that she had indeed boiled some of her parents' flesh, with remnants of it on the stovetop and in pots, which again the 18-year-old had made no attempt to clean to hide the evidence. When the police interviewing her pressed her for a motive, why she had taken such shocking and violent steps, she replied that for many years both her mother and father had spoken about ending the misery their lives had become and in a way she felt doing it for them was an act of kindness. 
With the evidence gathered at the scene and the full confession by the 18-year-old, Qi Pingping was charged with the intentional homicide of her parents. On May 31, 2010, Qi Pingping faced trial. Over 100 students from her school turned out to sit in on the event. However, after the court finished reading the indictment, she informed them she had a statement to make. She retracted her confession, telling the judges that she felt that she deserved to die for what she had done, so she had lied to guarantee her death. However, she now had since found hope and a desire to live, and now wanted to tell the truth. The trial was adjourned to allow a new investigation to take place. And Qi Pingping would tell a much more sympathetic story to explain her actions. Born on the 15th of February 1991, Qi Pingping grew up in Lulou, a village on the outskirts of the city of Hebei, in China's central province of Henan. Like many other children in the country, until the age of six she was what is referred to in China as a liu shou er tong, or left behind child. In China, the term left behind child refers to children who are left to be raised by grandparents or other relatives in their hometowns, while the parents go out to work in other cities or provinces. In the past, few families would have been able to survive on a single income, so both parents would need to be working to provide. Even husbands and wives would be separated, working long hours in low-paid jobs, and living in dormitory accommodation provided by the company to save more money. The children would stay in their village and perhaps only see their parents once a year when they went back home for the spring festival. In recent years the practice has come under increased scrutiny, with many experts believing it has a negative impact on the psychological and emotional development of children. With her father working as a long-distance truck driver and her mother working as an insurance salesperson in another province, Qi Pingping was raised by her grandparents until the age of six. It was at this age her father found a decent paying job in the city of Zhongshan, which allowed her mother to stay at home, so she could look after Qi Pingping. However, in 2007, the father of Qi Pingping was involved in a car accident while working. Fortunate to avoid any major injuries in the crash, he was discovered to be suffering from cerebral thrombosis, a blood clot in the brain. This prevented him from driving while he received treatment for his condition. The family lost their main source of income and now had expensive medical bills to pay. On top of this were the tuition fees for their daughter's college. Qi Pingping was a freshman attending the Zhongshan campus of Guangdong Vocational Polytechnic. The mother of Qi Pingping opened an online store as well as selling insurance part-time to provide an income. Her father, feeling the family's financial troubles were his fault and being unable to do much to help turn to alcohol. He began drinking heavily despite his medical condition. With the hardships the family were now facing, the parents of Qi Pingping began to argue more frequently. During the blazing arguments her parents would talk of getting divorced and even ending their own lives. Her mother began suffering from insomnia and started taking sleeping pills on a regular basis. Often trying to act as peacemaker between her parents, Qi Pingping would get caught in the crossfire and frequently become a target of their anger. In 2008, her father's condition worsened and in an attempt to recover he went to see doctors in Beijing, spending the family's life savings in the process. However, the efforts and spending were in vain. He continued to get worse, and by 2009 had essentially become bedridden. With her father feeling like a drain on the family, and her mother struggling to cope with the pressures placed on her to be the provider, the parents of Qi Pingping made constant remarks about wanting to end their suffering and own lives. Arguments between them could last for days both lamenting the misery they felt for themselves, and just wanting to end it all. This put an enormous amount of mental strain on the teen Qi Pingping, and she began to cause harm to herself as a result. In the original confession, she had told police she attacked her mother after one argument too many. She now confessed that her parents decided to take an overdose of sleeping pills. She claimed in the previous days her mother had asked her to go to different medical centers around the city and tell doctors she was having trouble sleeping, so she'd be prescribed the medication. That night both her parents took an overdose in an attempt to end their suffering. However, her mother began feeling severe stomach cramps and was vomiting violently. Not being able to stand the sight and sounds of her mother's pain, Qi Pingping placed a plastic bag over her mother's head to end it. She then did the same to her father once he began to react badly to the sleeping pills. With both her parents now dead, Qi Pingping claimed in her new confession 
that she too attempted to end her own life, but was unable to go through with it. She next logged onto her computer and went online. She told one of her friends that she had just ended someone's life, but the friend thought it must be a joke and didn't take it seriously. After spending some time surfing the internet for methods of body disposal, she would get on with the grisly task. However, she found it much more difficult than expected. The remainder of her new confession didn't vary from the first. However, now she had changed the circumstances which led up to her taking her parents' lives, the charge of intentional homicide was in question. Shortly after her arrest, Xi Pingping went under a psychological evaluation, but no issues were found with her at the time, and that she was fully responsible and in control of her own actions. However, when looking through the girl's phone, police found photos of the injuries Qi Pingping had inflicted on herself prior to the death of her parents. This cast doubt on the results of the psychological evaluation she had been subject to previously. She then further changed her story by telling prosecutors she wasn't 18 years old. She claimed that her mother had registered her as one year older so that she could start her education earlier. She in actuality was 17, which would make her a minor. If this turned out to be true, it would mean the court wouldn't be able to sentence her as severely due to her being a child. Therefore, she would be able to escape the death penalty. With her mother and father both dead, the police had to go to her extended family to find out. Here the case would take a surprising twist. When trying to clarify the age of Qi Pingping, her aunt confirmed that she was 18, but her mother and father were not actually her biological parents. The couple had adopted Qi Pingping when she was a baby. When they approached her with this revelation, Qi Pingping herself was surprised. She never had any suspicion that they weren't her real parents, telling police they always treated her well, as if she was their own blood. While her biological parents were never identified publicly, it is worth noting that the uncle and aunt of Qi Pingping supported her throughout the trials. Even going so far as to write a number of letters to the courts, begging them to show understanding and leniency towards the young girl. There was no doubt she had ended the life of both parents, but the severity of her sentence would depend on which story the courts believed. After her second confession the remains of her victims were once again forensically examined. Residue from sleeping pills was found in the stomach and bladder of one victim, but not the other. Furthermore, the amount found was fairly insignificant, and wasn't enough to fully support the claims of Qi Pingping. Naturally, this created a lot of skepticism over the new confession. However, questions remained about how Qi Pingping managed to overpower her mother and why her father didn't shout for help while the attack was going on. It was felt that both being unconscious from ingesting sleeping pills would explain that. On December 27, 2010, Qi Pingping faced a second trial. The court would decide if she was guilty of intentional homicide or accept that there were the extenuating circumstances of her second confession. There were four major points the court had to consider. Firstly, the claims that the parents of Qi Pingping were attempting to end their own lives. While the forensic evidence called her confession into question, the fact that Qi Pingping had been asked by her mother to go to three different hospitals to get the prescription pills suggested there was some truth to the story. Secondly, the question of how she managed to end both parents' lives. Obviously, with her father being bedridden, he would not have been able to offer much resistance. But there were questions over how she overpowered her mother so easily and why her father didn't call for help as he watched the attack. Thirdly, the court took into account the age of Qi Pingping and the fact that she had no previous criminal record. Character witnesses described her as a friendly, kind young woman who had never shown people anything to suggest she was even capable of doing something like this. Finally, the court took into consideration the support she received from her uncle and aunt. The decision to forgive her and please that the courts show her mercy would play a large part in the final sentencing. After taking those into account, the court decided that she was still guilty of intentional homicide and was sentenced to death. However, due to the uncertainty of the exact circumstances, the age of Qi Pingping and the family's forgiveness, the death penalty was suspended for two years. After being handed her sentence, she asked if she could have a pen and piece of paper, with which she wrote a letter of thanks to the court for their understanding and giving her the opportunity to become a new person. 
The suspension of the death sentence meant that if Qi Pingping didn't cause any problems in prison and showed a good attitude towards rehabilitation, then her sentence would be commuted. After the two-year suspension, the death penalty was lowered to life imprisonment for Qi Pingping. This was due to her attitude and behavior while incarcerated. This means every 10 years her sentence will be reviewed, and as long as no new evidence in her case is discovered, and she doesn't break the law in jail, then her sentence will likely be further reduced. It is entirely possible that, 14 years after ending her parents' lives, Qi Pingping could find herself being freed in the not too distant future. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. And hope to see you again for the next Dark Tale from the Middle Kingdom.